Hey guys, the name is Chris Parochi, welcome to Common Time 14. Today we're going to be talking about how to make a VOS finish, pedals and switchers, 60 cycle hum and noise gates with singing coils, stainless steel frets, removing humbucker covers, linear and logarithmic parts, and we have to figure out if I have issues. <laughs> Let's start with the question so many of you guys asked. Uh, it's about this guitar. Uh, yeah, that one. Mega1976. Hi Chris, how did you manage to change from the gloss to the VOS finish? Dave Park, how did you get the VOS look in the finish? I want to do it to my Les Paul standard, but I can't find any info on techniques. Lane Tacker, how did you make it more of a VOS finish without ice can? That's gonna be interesting, we'll talk about that. Alexander or Alex Sandor. That's a great example of a guitar, thanks for sharing. I would really like to know what was the secret um, of making the finish less glossy. Lane Tacker asked about the ice can, if um, like how I made the VOS finish without an ice can. Well, first of all, I did use an ice can, um, like an ice spray, whatever it's called, uh, for the crackles on the finish, but that doesn't have to do anything with the finish being glossy or VOS or satin or whatever. Well, it's actually relatively simple. All I did was using these uh, micro mesh pads, just a sec. These usually go from 1500 grit to uh, 12,000. If you have a high gloss finish, you have to sort of reverse polish <laughs> the guitar to make it less glossy, which means that you start with the finest one and then you go back to, you know, 8,000, probably six, maybe even to four-ish, but um, that depends on what you want to get. Uh, you should definitely sand wet. If you sand dry, you will scratch the guitar surface and those scratches will be worse and worse with each and every step if you go lower on, with the grit. So um, that's pretty simple and sort of logical. Uh, the way I figured this out was just to inverse the idea of polishing an instrument. I've shown quite a few close-ups of the guitar in my video about it and uh, I'll put the video in the description box too and also uh, a link to these uh, micro mesh pads in case you want to check them out. Um, so it's still glossy, it's just uh, a little bit less obvious and not like a, a mirror basically. I, I really love this look to be honest. <laughs> Jan Lavitsky wanted to know this for a long time. Sorry, Jan, that it took so long. I'm on it right now. <laughs> Here's a question. Difference between linear and audio potentiometers. Which is for volume, which is for tone? Can I use four times audio for my last poem? And what would be a benefit of that? Many thanks and uh, you rock, Chris. Kusunam. <laughs> See you The term audio potentiometer is basically logarithmic, maybe not exactly logarithmic. I'm not sure if you know this curve. Linear potentiometers will um, have like from one to 10 a very straight curve of uh, changing the volume. That is the measured, like the perfect measured potentiometer. The only problem with that, well, it's not a problem, <laughs> a side effect is that our hearing is not linear. Audio taper is basically 
compensated um, that our hearing, our ears, will say that it's linear, which is not linear if you measure the, the curve of that potentiometer. So uh, linear is the measured perfect part, and audio taper is basically what, for us human beings, sounds linear. Um, that's mainly something you would want to use on uh, the volume on your guitar, because that's where you really need that perception of perfect taper or perfect perfect uh, volume change. If you use overdrive or heavy distortion and you want to use your volume pot to go back with that drive, you really don't want to use a linear pot because otherwise um, it will just not do what you want. Here's an example. Clean guitar, linear pot on 10, that's going to be full volume. Linear pot on 5, that's going to be somewhat 50% volume and then on zero, it's gone. But a linear pot, when you play an overdriven sound, is gonna be 100% on 10, obviously, then like 90% on five, and then zero on zero. That's, that's the effect of using an overdrive together with a linear pot. Let's do the same thing with um, a logarithmic pot. Uh, you play a clean tone with your guitar, you have a logarithmic pot. You have it on 10, 100% sound. You have it on five, 20% sound. And then you around, these are not exact numbers. And then on zero, it's of course uh, muted. And then overdriven sounds with a logarithmic pot is gonna be 100% volume on 10, um, sort of 60%, but way less distortion on five, basically a clean sound on five, and then muted at zero, obviously. <laughs> That's why you want to go audio taper or logarithmic if you are using overdrives and distortion and whatever most of the time. And for the tone pot, I think I prefer linear pots because that way I know exactly without trying to remember what was what, you know, if you're on five on the tone pot, you have around 50% more like dark tone. <laughs> Diego Magar has a question about pedal switchers. There's something that I don't get with the switcher. Can I change the configuration of each pedal? I mean, for example, in loop one, I want the Boss DS1 with the tone in the middle and a reverb. Then in loop two, I want the same Boss DS1, but this time with full tone plus a delay. Can a switcher change the setting of a pedal when I change the banks? I'm really confused and all the data I found uh, don't explain this well. Uh, no, they can't. Switchers cannot control the pedals themselves unless it's a switcher with uh, MIDI capabilities and a pedal with MIDI capabilities. That's going to be a different story. But if we're talking about a normal pedal switcher that has a couple of loops where you can sort of connect pedals and then you can turn on and off those pedals or combine all those pedals, that's mostly what they can do. Uh, there are some programmable ones which uh, can uh, give you presets, basically. Let's say preset one is gonna be loop one and loop two, which is your DS1 and a, a delay. And then preset two is gonna be loop one and loop three, 
which is again the DS1 and a reverb. So uh, this way you can combine different effects and you can have the same pedal on more presets basically. <laughs> Nicodemus Janssen, or Janssen? Hey Chris, great video. Quick question, how do you go about trying different pickups? Do you actually install them in your guitar and play for a few weeks, or do you try them in other guitars? And how do you compare them, AB? Okay, very good question, and I'm, I'm pretty sure many of us guitar players um, think about this a lot, like how, well, how will I, try all those pickups and how will I decide which is best and this and that. I changed a lot of pickups in my life, <laughs> in all of my guitars basically. Um, I don't go crazy on AB comparing pickups. I will grab one pickup or one pair of pickups or like three if it's a Strat and then, um, and then put them in and listen to my impressions, like what my heart is saying. If I feel that the guitar is better, then I stick to that for a while. I will not start A-being it with the original. I don't care if there's a big difference or a small difference. If the guitar all of a sudden feels more right, then I'm good. If I fall in love with the guitar, with the new pickups, immediately or after a few weeks, I will just stick to those pickups for a longer time. And if I feel like there's still something I'm missing. I will research. I do a lot of preparation before I change pickups in a guitar of mine. I listen to demos, watch YouTube videos, um, read all the uh, specs and all the infos I can get on that set of pickups, uh, try to find someone who has experience with those pickups. Um, and as soon as I'm convinced enough to do the hassle, <laughs> of changing pickups, soldering and all that, uh, then I will do it. And in most cases, I'm more satisfied after changing the pickups because of all that research um, than, than the other way around. I barely ever had to say I'm disappointed and I, I went back to the old ones. You asked about trying out pickups in other guitars before installing them in my own. Uh, I do that and I also do not think it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> at the same time. Um, of course, I let pickups and guitars influence me and sort of make me want to try it out. If I heard them in other guitars and I really liked them, but at the same time, I know that that doesn't make a lot of sense because the same pickup will sound very different in three different guitars. Okay, let's figure out if I have some serious issues. Tom Ford. Well, you no longer have a 58 reissue, but you do have issues. Several. <laughs> you say there are things you don't like about the guitar, that you love it, and you change nearly everything except the wood. Seamus Brown, Brownie. He liked the guitar so much, he changed everything about it he could. Electronics, pickups, finish. It's actually quite disconcerting to find that a lot of the comments sound equally out to lunch. I can just imagine the audience at one of his gigs. Wow, those mods make all the difference. Okay, if you're not a tweaker, I can totally understand your concern. <laughs> it, it just sounds ridiculous to buy something that you fall in love with and then change a lot of things on it. When I buy a guitar, I don't buy a full spec list. When I buy a guitar, I barely plug that guitar in an amp. When I decide on liking a guitar or not, all I want to do is sit down with it and play it unplugged. And I'm talking about electric guitars, not only semi-hollows or acoustics or bass or whatever. I do believe that a guitar should impress you without being plugged in. If a guitar doesn't inspire me with its unplugged sound, I'm out. 
I, I, I cannot buy a guitar like that. So uh, that's what makes it really hard for me to buy guitars <laughs> for many years now. And I do practice a lot without playing with amps. I, I just, that's something I do a lot. So I do care about my guitar's unplugged sound as well. And not only because of that. There's something I figured out a couple of years ago, actually. I had quite a few older guitars where I swapped pickups a number of times without any success. The main tone of the guitar didn't change, didn't get any better. And uh, later on, I figured, of course, because the main tone of the guitar, which has nothing to do with the pickups, the resonances and, and all the reaction um, of the guitar is still the same. So how would the pickup pick up different string vibrations if the whole guitar just doesn't let the strings to do their best. Since then, I never made a mistake. I never bought a guitar I didn't like after it and I couldn't use it as it is or modify it to be exactly how I wanted it to be. This is not voodoo. This is not, I don't know, uh, placebo. This actually works. So when I bought my custom shop Les Paul, I bought the guitar. I didn't buy the pickups, I didn't buy the bridge, I didn't buy the pots or the tuners or whatever it is. I bought the guitar itself because I felt that it resonates, it has a crazy sustain, it has all the, the twanginess I really wanted and I was looking for for so many years and um, I just had to, to buy it. And I knew it right at the beginning that I will want to change a few things on it. I mean, think of a computer nerd, a programmer, whatever. They buy a crazy spec PC. They will not stick to the factory settings, will they? <laughs> they will change things and make it look different and make their shortcuts and tweak the hell out of that system. Exactly the same thing here. I loved the guitar as it was. I fell in love with it as it was, but I knew I will want to tweak subtle things. A different pair of pickups made the guitar sound even more like what I wanted from a Les Paul. I had a very exact picture and tone and everything of what I wanted and I couldn't find it. This was the closest one, so I got it and tweaked it. And about Seamus's comment on my audience recognizing all these mods and whatever and appreciating all these mods on the guitar, no one cares about these mods except for me. But I also buy the guitar for myself and not for my audience. I never understand why so many people are concerned about, yeah, no one can tell in a live situation if you're using a modeler or a real amp, if it's a, um, a cheaper single cut or an original Les Paul, which pickups are you using? Of course they can tell, but that's not the point. I don't want to impress other people with my rig. I want to impress and inspire myself. And I think that's what everyone should do because at the end of the day, that's what matters. You will play better if you feel more inspired. guy. I'm new. Does stage volume even matter since speakers are supposed to be mic'd? Technically, you should be able to play an arena with a pig nose, right? <laughs> totally, man. You can grab the smallest toy black stars or marshals, these tiny things, and uh, put a mic in front of them and play in Wembley. Not an issue at all. It's uh, more about the tone and uh, Volume doesn't really matter at all, especially as soon as you play venues where the monitoring is cool. Like you have a small amp with a mic in front of it and you have good wedges or, or in-ear monitoring, you're good. You don't even need an amp at all. You can just use your Helix or Camper, or whatever you prefer, and uh, have zero volume on stage and still have perfect sound in your in-ears or in your wedges and the audience thinks you rock a full stack. So it's all possible. You're absolutely right. No one argues about that anymore, uh, except for those who mainly or only have experience with really small gigs where 
no one will bring a PA or if it's going to be a real small one where you only put maybe vocals on it and uh, that's it. No one mics the drums. And so it's like a, a real proper small club gig. In that case, you really want to make sure that your amp has enough juice to keep up with the drummer at least, because that's going to bring you up to a volume where you're sort of in balance with all the loud acoustic instruments like drums and then match that with um, a bass player that has a, a fitting volume and then all you need to amplify with a PA system is the vocals and backing vocals and maybe a keyboard and that. I'm really sorry I cannot read out your name, I cannot read Russian letters, so sorry. Cyrillic, right? Cyrillic letters. Hey Chris, thanks for the video first of all. I'd like to see this kind of video about all of your guitars. Um, that was uh, my video about my last ball. Um, I believe each of them has its unique story. They really do. Um, and they're coming up, don't worry. Do you have a video about pickup cover removing? Is it easy? Can I go back? I want to try it with my Harley Benton Fusion T Roswell pickups, but I'm not sure about my skills. Uh, it's not super hard to get rid of the cover. Um, those pickups are gonna be waxed, so you will have to probably heat it up a bit just grab a normal hair dryer and um, heat up the pickup to a point where you feel that you can sort of push off the, the cover. Talking of Roswell pickups, this came out of my uh, Harley Benton Fusion 2 and uh, I still have the cover on. I never bothered putting it off. Let me know in the comments if you want to see uh, how to remove a uh, humbucker cover video. If um, a lot of you guys want to see that, I can make it happen, sure, no problem. Mainly what you have to do is cut through these solder joints here and here in the middle. You need a soldering iron, of course, and some sort of um, a knife, maybe something, or a flathead screwdriver that can get in there while the uh, tin is hot and uh, you can sort of separate it. And then after that, you just have to heat up the pickup with a hairdryer or whatever and just push it off, like hold it um, here where the ears are and just push it to the to the top with your thumb basically or whichever tool <laughs> works for you. Rick Hill. Nice video Chris. I have a personal problem with 60 cycle hum. Would you please tell me do you use a noise gate when playing single coil pickups? Thank you. Cheers from Salem, Ohio, US. Hey Rick, thanks a lot for the question. That's actually something that I've been asked a million times because I tend to use a lot of single coil guitars. I used to have and use um, noise gates all the time back in the days when I was using high gain amps because most of those high gain amps tend to have way more noise than what I have now with single coil guitars going into overdrive pedals. Okay, I admit it, I also use way less distortion, but uh, I'm not a clean player at all, by any means. I'm, uh, I, I always have at least one overdrive pedal on, if not two stacked. So um, still, I never have serious issues with um, 60 cycle hum. What I do is use my volume pot all the time. I got used to that back in the days when I was using a lot of gain and humbucker modern guitars and seven strings and whatever. Feedback was an issue because of all that gain. And uh, I just got used to that. It was a, a must thing to do. As soon as I stopped playing, every staccato thing or every short break or finish with a lick or whatever, volume down immediately on the guitar, volume on zero. And I got used to that, so that was not an issue for me when I started using my Strat as my main guitar, and then a few years later, 
in 2014, 15, I'm not sure, I started uh, using my, my tellies. You will not have a 60 cycle hum if you have your volume down, right? And uh, when I'm playing, there might be some hum every now and then, but honestly, I mean, I can show it now with uh, playing something that um, has some gain on, and I'm not gonna be far from my amp, and I will not use the volume part. <laughs> I never had the feeling that anything is worse now using single coils than earlier with the humbuckers. Maxime Tremblay. Hey Chris, can you elaborate on the stainless steel frets? What don't you like about them? Is it the question of feel or sound? I'm asking because I'm at the stage where the divots in my nickel frets are getting too deep to sand down and polish. I was considering stainless steel for increased durability, but not at the expense of sound. Thanks again for the awesome content, cheers. Hey Maxime, thanks for the question. I've mentioned this in the first part of my Silver Sparkle modifying video series, uh, that the Silver Sparkle, this guitar, <laughs> has stainless steel frets, and that's not something I normally prefer. Uh, it, it is about the tone. I, of course, love the, f the way they play. Super smooth, a uh, dream to bend, and they don't wear off uh, that fast. My issue is that I tend to not like something about most guitars with stainless steel frets, even before I figure out that they have stainless steel frets. There were some guitars, like in the Tomon um, showroom, where I tried them out, I played them, and I was like, yeah, it's such a good guitar, but there's something cold about it. <laughs> if you know what I mean, tonally. Something sort of hi-fi, um, which doesn't really matter if you play high gain, but as soon as you play with less gain, there was just something small, you know, I still like the guitar a lot, but there was something that was annoying me a little. And then I figured out, ah, okay, stainless steel frets. Didn't think too much about it, moved on, you know, next time, next guitar, same thing. Oh, stainless steel frets, okay, hmm. This is obviously not a proper scientific test or anything, so for that reason, I would not even state that I don't like stainless steel frets. I just don't prefer them. And uh, this is not a big difference, as told, um, just minor things like this sizzliness on top and, um, and a bit less warmth to the sound. Aaron May. One, DOD looking glass, a sparkling dumble. Two, amp 11, creamy goodness. Three, fat mod, that's the Keeley super fat mod. You know it, smiley. Amazing vintage sounds. What I miss is a good high gain sound. Wow, so many options. <laughs> um, Friedman pedals, killer pedals. Bogner, the ecstasy red, so good. Um, oh my god, the Rev pedals. The uh, G3 is more like the modern metal kind of uh, tone, but uh, you can get a G2 as well for um, for more of a classic rock uh, high gain sound. You could also try out what I do when I play higher gain sounds, like for example my Ken Atali Gent <laughs> video is uh, using a very amp-like sounding, sort of clear sounding crunch pedal, something like a uh, bluesbreaker, which means like the Wampler Pantheon, the King of Tone, the Double Troubles right side, the clean drive side, um, all of these pedals, there's so many options. Um, grab one of those and put something tube streamery or OD1, OD3, those kind of uh, pedals in front of that. This will give you such a rich and thick and super tight high gain sound. It's unbelievable. Even though both of those pedals you stack are not metal at all and not high gain at all. If you stack them, it's incredible. When I discovered this, uh, that was the turning point. That's where I went away from amp distortion and um, I barely ever use a distorted amp since then because of the amount of combinations and possibilities I can get with pairing the right pedals, it's mind-blowing. 
it's all the versatility and uh, all the options right in front of you and pedals cost way less than owning 10 different amps, right? See you down there in the comment section. Let me know if you have any questions. You might end up in one of these comment time videos. You guys take it easy. I'll be back. Bye-bye.